Hello, tough guys. John Gleason is a longtime attorney whose distinguished career includes time as a federal prosecutor, federal judge presiding at more than 200 trials, and a practicing defense attorney. He was also the lead prosecutor in the successful racketeering murder trials of John Gotti and Vic Orena respectively the bosses of the Gambino and Colombo crime families. And that is the subject of his new book, The Gotti Wars, Taking Down America's Most Notorious Mobster. John, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show, Trey. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, John. So what was your goal with this book? My goal with this book originally was, you know, recognizing that I was involved in some pretty interesting uh, events in the 10 years I was investigating and prosecuting gangsters. I actually, you know, my kids were tiny at the time and my goal was to write it down for them because I was afraid I'd be too old or too dead to tell it to them when they were old enough to hear, hear about it. And then it took me longer than I thought. They're in their mid twenties now so you know the scribner was kind enough to publish it so i published it it's a look it's the mob it just doesn't get any more interesting than that yeah no doubt so in early 1985 you were sworn in as an assistant u.s attorney in the eastern district of new york why was this such an alluring position for you and what's the difference between that and the very well-known southern district <laughs> uh well, look, the allure was I became a lawyer. I liked it, but let's face it, the criminal stuff is like way more interesting than antitrust and securities work and the like, you know, contract disputes. I got no problem with that. I do some of that now, but the criminal stuff is, you know, more interesting to talk about uh, when you're at a family dinner and I was attracted to it. I wasn't attracted to necessarily being a prosecutor. You know, I grew up on the Godfather, like a lot of people my age, and I kind of wanted to be Tom Hagen, you know, the consigliere to the, to the Corleone family. But um, you can't start out as a, as a defense lawyer, as a young person, you can start out as a prosecutor. So I became a prosecutor. Eastern New York is Brook also known as Brooklyn. It's a US attorney's office in Brooklyn and you know, the Southern District of New York is regarded as, it certainly regards itself as the flagship U.S. Attorney's Office in the country. The, they call themselves the Sovereign District. We're across the river, a uh, different district, covers Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island and Long Island. And, uh, you know, kind of acts, you know, acts as a little bit the, the step stepbrother of Southern, but you know, we were the real deal too. How did you become involved in the first Gotti case, which was initially referred to as the Della Croce case? Yeah, well, I walked in the door, brand new AUSA, didn't know anything about anything about criminal law because I came from a big law firm. I knew about antitrust securities and I could write well. And the senior prosecutor on that case, Diane Jackalone, a great lawyer, had put together a big RICO case and there were gonna be motions to dismiss coming out your ears. So she needed some help, someone who could write. I, it was thought that I could write having come from a big firm. So they assigned me to help Diane fend off the motions and then help her try the case. Took us a couple of years, year and a half to get to trial but I helped her try that case. And your first responsibility in helping her try the case was learning about the charges. In doing so, you found out something pretty stupid that would become a centerpiece of this case. What was it? Well, stupid overstates it, Trey, but it was, you know, we kind of, we made a mistake. The case was an in, in RICO, racketeering parlance, the the organization that commits the crime is called an enterprise. That's the legal phrase for it. And you know, when you charge an organized crime case, the enterprise is like the Gambino family or the Genovese family or the Lucchese family, whatever the family is. But we had charged a little subset, two captains reporting to Delacroach, who was the underboss 
as the enterprise. Didn't seem like a big mistake at the time, but it turned out to kind of be in, in retrospect, um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Why was meeting with accomplice witnesses one of the most interesting parts of putting this case together, John? Well, you know, for your for your uh, audience, accomplice witnesses are you know people who committed the crimes with your defendants, so they plead guilty and join Team America and get on the witness stand in exchange for lenient treatment in the crimes they pled guilty to, and we had this motley crew of kind of low level accomplice witnesses. They were not made guys. They were not captains or consuliers or underbosses. They were like mopes. And uh, they all had their own interesting story about them. Um, you know, it's not easy to wend your way to the witness stand in a case against John Gotti. And so these guys had done some stuff and uh, gotten on Team America. You know, they all joined, they all became go government witnesses before John Gotti burst onto the scene as boss by killing Paul Castellano. So they basically signed up for a much less pressurized performance on the witness stand than the one they ended up uh, performing. And uh, they weren't great. They were pretty, they were very impeachable folks and they were impeached pretty well too. So throughout the, uh, the pre-trial fact finding and research that y'all were doing, there was a problem that surfaced and that is that your office didn't get along very well with the FBI's Gambino squad. Why was this and how did it make things more difficult for your case, John? Yeah, well, look, we, before I started as the case was running up to the point where there was gonna be an indictment returned, the, uh, the indictment had, 10 names in it. And it turned out, unbeknownst to the people in my office, the US attorney and the assistant US attorney, Diane, turned out two of the people in the indictment were informants, FBI informants. So they were, you know, prosecutors don't know who the informants are, only the agents do. The agents regard today's prosecutors as tomorrow's defense lawyers. So those are tightly hmm. kept secrets. Anyway, one of the two informants was a, a TE, top echelon informant for the FBI, Willie Boyd Johnson. So the FBI came to the US attorney and said, uh, you know, two of these guys are our sources. You can't indict them. And uh, the US attorney to his credit said, well, yes, we can because your source like committed the murder and we're not gonna give him a pass just because he's your source. You know, the FBI had promised both of these sources confidentiality forever, like they will never burn you. So once they were indicted, their informant status became in play and they got burned. So the FBI was furious, walked away from helping out with the case. So Diane and I basically prosecuted the case uh, without their help. And in fact, there were certain ways in which they kind of got in the way, but it was, it was bad. You know, the mob cases are notoriously hard to prosecute. The uh, FBI really knows what it's doing. If you're a prosecutor, you really need their help. And we didn't have their help. And while that's one problem, something else major happened about nine months in to uh, you researching and getting ready for this case. What exactly was it and how did it change the course of things? Yeah, well, we, uh, they called a defense witness who, uh, who accused me and my wife of uh, giving him opiates in exchange as trying to get him to testify falsely about John Gotti. And as bad as that sounds, I got off kind of easy because the same defense witness uh, testified that Diane, the lead prosecutor in that first case, had uh, given him sexual favors, basically. Hmm. Also in an effort to try to get him to give perjured testimony against John Gotti. So there we were, you know, trying a mob boss and all of a sudden trying to 
fend off allegations that we were the criminals. What was very pleasant. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very difficult, and you do a great job of describing it in the book. So this trial was the first time that you were ever up close and personal with John Gotti, if I'm not mistaken. What was sure. so special about Gotti in person, John? Well, look, he, you know, he, most crime bosses, I didn't really know this at the time because I was new, but most crime bosses recognize that they're criminals, they're gangsters called organized crime for a reason. So they kind of stay below the radar, right? They wear rumpled clothing in their social clubs. Chin Giganti shuffled around Greenwich Village for a couple of decades in a bathrobe pretending he was crazy just so he would have a defense when he got arrested. Hmm. The unique thing about John Gotti was he wanted to be and was the first celebrity crime boss. He, he knew about our fascination with the mob. He knows that he knew that as a society, you know, we kind of see what we want to see in gangsters. We glorify them. So he played that to the hilt. And in my interactions with him, you know, my first serious, I had a lot of banter with, with him in the courtroom. It was a seven month trial. But my first serious interaction with him was after we played a a tape recording that really wasn't that incriminating. It was just him screaming like a jerk, really, mm -hmm. at an underling who hadn't returned his phone call. And he came storming at the next break. He came storming up to me and uh, was very upset that we played that call. And I said, well, well why? It's not, all it shows is that you're in charge and, you know, everybody knows you were in charge at, the, at your social club. And he said, it's bad for my image. So, you know, he, he actually thought he had a public and he thought he had an image as the Dapper Don, which is kind of, you know, anathema to being a gangster. You know, the, by promoting this image, he basically brought down the entire mob because by strutting around and, sh and showing the world he was the crime boss, he was basically sticking a finger in the eye of the FBI which mobilized in a major way against all the families, not just the Gambinos. You know, there were, when I was at the, at the time in the late eighties, early nineties, there were eight squads in the FBI New York office, eight squads devoted solely to La Cosa Nostra investigations and prosecutions. There are only five families. So he was, you know, he chose to comport himself as a mob boss in a way he saw fit as a celebrity, but he basically brought the, the, uh, all the resources of the FBI down on the entire mafia. It was a turning point, not just for him and the Gambino family, but for all of La Cosa Nostra as we knew it back then. And he was also treated like a celebrity during that first trial. How did some of the usual routines surrounding defendants in criminal trials differ with Gotti? Yeah, he was allowed to, you know, normally, he was detained during the trial. He was in pretrial detention as a danger to the community. But normally, you know, when you're in detention, you change down in the marshal's cell and during the, down in the marshal's cell block in the basement of the courthouse, and you eat the standard, not so good fare for lunch that the marshals serve down in the cell block. But he was allowed to use a separate, a jury room in the courthouse to get dressed and get himself all pampered and talcum powdered up before each trial day. And he was also allowed, judge allowed the, the defendants, he was one of seven defendants who went to trial, allowed the defendants to have lunch, you know, catered, brought in from an Italian restaurant into the court, into the courtroom, which was locked uh, each lunch hour so that the co-defendant, all the defendants and their lawyers could have a catered lunch. It was, it was unusual treatment, to be sure. How did Gotti eat his pasta? <laughs> we weren't there. Oh, you know, okay. they, compared to the lead prosecutor, Diane, I was, until the, until the defense witness got on the stand and accused us of committing crimes, I was not Diane, so I was the favored one. And some of the co-defendants were actually nice guys. And they offered, you know, they, they would say, I, 
I was welcome to stick around for the rigatoni and the pasta and stuff. But, uh, you know, I got out and we got locked out. So I don't know. I don't know how, what he likes for lunch. That defense witness, by the way, for anybody who's planning on picking up this book is Matt Trainer, And uh, you find out more about him and his testimony in the chapter titled Trainer. Now, ultimately, uh, Gotti was found not guilty on both charges that he was brought up for. What was it like finding out how the jury had ruled, considering that you uh, felt like you had some pretty firm evidence to get him convicted there? Well, look, we were we were crushed. Seven months trial, 94 witnesses. We thought the case, I mean, we had that snafu with a uh, trainer, but we put on a rebuttal case for a month with parading in FBI agents who proved that he was perjuring himself. The trainer was perjuring himself. So week, week of deliberations, jury proceeded methodically through all the charges. You could tell from their notes. So we were pretty confident. And I uh, should have known it was Friday the 13th of March, hmm. 1987, jury comes back and acquittals across the board in a courtroom full of mobsters there to support the boss. And uh, it was pandemonium. And it was, uh, I mean, without a doubt, like the worst day of my, of our professional careers. It was, it was terrible. Tabloids were, you know, it was, the, uh, the younger audience now has no feel at all for, in the pre-9-11 days, how central the mafia was to our media and our culture. You know, it was, we were, this was front page of the tabloids every day. So front page of the tabloids after the acquittals was John Gotti asking for investigations of Diane and me for the crimes that his witness accused us of. It was pretty, it was bad. John, does it make you sick to your stomach at all to see how popular culture has really glamorized the mobster lifestyle over the last 20 plus years? No, not really. I mean, I do think we all need therapy, you know, ever since like, I don't know, Jesse James or Bonnie and Clyde, we have this fascination with outlaws. Mm. And as I mentioned before, we see in them what we want to see in them. We superimpose this is kind of glorified view, which has nothing to do with what they really are. But the reason I'm not sick about it, Trey, is look, it accounts for the market for this book I've, I've written. John Gotti died 20 years ago. The second of the two Gotti wars that I fought, the second of the two trials, was 30 years ago. There's a, you know, there's a reason there's a, there's still an appetite for this stuff. And it's because of this whole thing about art trying to imitate life and the Godfather and the Sopranos and Goodfellas. It doesn't do that good a job. And it turns out the life, mobster life, La Cosa Nostra life, actually, as we, as we learned from Sammy the Bull when he flipped, kind of tried to imitate art and neither one did a very good job of doing it. Um, but, I, you know, I, I was always fascinated by the media's fascination with John Gotti and by the, our culture's fascination with organized crime because um, it's, it's pretty weird. We do need therapy. I guess to your point, you initially wanted to be a lawyer because of the Godfather. So uh, yeah. had a positive impact on at least one person's right. life. Right. Uh, speaking on that second Gotti trial, um, the uh, what was the Raven? Uh, the I'm sorry, let me start that again. What was the Ravenite? Why did you bug the apartment above it? And just how quickly did you get damning evidence on, on Gotti when that bug went live? Yeah, we well, we found out, you know, Gangsters are way too smart to talk about crimes in social clubs. So we had a bug in the Ravenite, which is on the ground floor of 247 Mulberry Street in Little Italy. But we didn't expect to get anything good out of it. But we found out through an informant that um, there was a, an old lady's apartment up above in the same building above the club that John Gotti and his boss, his underboss rather, and his concierge would use for meetings. 
and um, you know, we got a bug in there. And like that, we had this window. I mean, it was just the administration of the family, the boss, the underboss, the consigliere were the only ones who went up there. And right away, you know, I mean, all, all they talk about is crime. And uh, so right away, we had a wealth of information. Some of it crystal clear, people they had killed or were gonna kill. Some of it opaque because they're continuing conversations. They started as they're coming up the stairs and will continue after they leave. But that's where investigation comes in. So we did a ton of investigation to figure out to the degree it wasn't apparent from the conversations themselves, figure out what they were talking about. Because they were talking about, you know, other families, bosses and other people and other families and corrupt unions and people they killed. It was quite a window into into the Gambino family, into the mob generally. And if I'm not mistaken, two conversations in, you had John Gotti admitted to ordering a murder. Yeah, we did. And uh you know, didn't, that sounds like already a slam dunk case. And in a way it was, mm. but, um, you know, we thought we had a slam dunk case. We thought we had a winner the first time. This was obviously better evidence, but, you know, he had a special way of defending himself, which was not hiding behind the presumption of innocence or the burden of proof, but it was intimidation, right? Yeah, sure. I'm the boss of the Gambino family. But what are you going to do about it? That that's, you know, in large part how he defended himself. That's one of the many ways he distinguished himself from everybody else. We prosecuted a lot of gangsters, and none of them like him. How did you become chief of organized crime in the Eastern District around the same time, thus leading the case versus Gotti, Sammy Gravano, and Frank uh, Locas Locascio uh, uh, as a result? Yeah, sure. Well, look, I, 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 the moment I started as an AUSA, as an assistant U.S. attorney, I was on that first case. And even though I had other positions in the office, I was chief of appeals, chief of special prosecutions, which is official corruption. I could never get away from the gangsters. I tried a bunch of gangster cases after the acquittals. And then... Um, just fortuitously, like right as the Ravenite bug um, was underway, I was asked by the United States Attorney, Andy Maloney, a great guy and a great lawyer and a great leader to, um, to lead organized crime. And it was just, you know, so it was a few years after the, those devastating acquittals, the bug was in play. Um, so it was a chance I was really lucky, Trey, when you think about it. You know, most prosecutors go a, a whole career hoping to prosecute one case of the magnitude, the case against John Gotti. And I, you know, in, within five years, I got to prosecute two of them against the same defendant. So I was lucky. And with that second case, you nearly lost it to the Southern District. Why was this especially frustrating and what ultimately kept that from happening, John? Well, we... Yeah, they tried to take our case, um, take all our evidence in our case. Uh, but we, uh, you know, it was a dispute between two prosecutors' offices, which was resolved um, way back then down in the Department of Justice in Maine Justice by the criminal division chief, who happened to be Bob Mueller, the special counsel who, in, who uh, investigated Donald Trump. But we, we made our arguments. I mean, it was our case. We had all the sweat equity. We knew it inside out. We had a big, uh, broad-based RICO indictment we were ready to go with. They wanted to take it and tack it onto a, uh, a, a single count case they had. Anyway, we had a turf battle and we won the battle because we should have. Uh, Bob Mueller ruled in our favor. You had the uh, stronger case too, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, we had a great case and they had a terrible one. So what did you end up charging Gotti and his associates with then? Yeah, we charged him with uh, five murders. We just charged the boss, the underboss and the consigliere. 
and we charged Scotty with five murders, so a bunch of a big kind of a gambling count that embraced a bunch of gambling establishments. Same thing with loan sharking, labor racketeering, obstructions of justice. You know, like uh, uh, they had hooks. They call them hooks in law enforcement where they would get secret information. So we had, you know, basically the whole palette of crimes, conspiracy to murder a guy they didn't actually kill, whole palette of crimes that get charged against members of organized crime. And uh, it was a good, strong case. Most of those crimes, we also charged Frank Lacasio, who was the acting consigliere and uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano, who was the underboss. They were all charged with at least one murder. Sammy had three, John had five. So these three guys are eventually arrested and during their first court appearance, you actually use those bug, uh, bugged recordings as a tool and you didn't even necessarily play anything. How did you use them as a, uh, a tool to really further get what you wanted? Well, what we wanted then at the time was all three defendants in detention because they were dangerous to the community. I wanted them in. I didn't want, it was a, a media that was all too eager to glorify John Gotti, you know, in one of the other cases that he beat where he was uh, on release pending the trial, he was given $50 bills to homeless people and, hmm. you know, putting on a show for the media. We wanted them in because he was, a murderer. So we got him in and we did it by playing excerpts, snippets of those Ravenite tapes. Um, and one of those tapes from which we played excerpts was John Gotti. It was a conversation that did not involve Gravano, his underboss, but it involved John Gotti complaining to his consigliere, Frank Lacasio, about Gravano. And Gravano heard snippets of those tapes, heard pieces of that conversation in the detention hearing. And it, it played a role 11 months later in his decision to uh, switch governments, as he put it, become my witness. Yeah, we'll certainly get to some of those details in just a second. Uh, first, though, why was it important to get Bruce Cutler and Jerry Shargle removed from Gotti's legal team? And how exactly did you make that happen? Well, it was important because they weren't, you know, Bruce and Jerry, um, you know, were devoted to their clients and uh, devoted to John Gotti. And they went down to the club and both of them were intercepted on our bug. There was a one in the club, one in the hallway outside the club on the way up to the apartment and one in the apartment. And both of them were intercepted in the hallway bug as integral. So they played a role. We didn't, we, we didn't tell, we didn't allege that they committed crimes, but they were instruments of crime by John Gotti and they were witnesses to crime. They had in the hallway while a corrupt law enforcement hook, a source of information was part of the same conversation. And lawyers are professionals, you know, they're not just hired, they're not, uh, popular view is they're just hired guns, but you know, we're professionals, we had ethical rules. You can't be both part of the evidence in the case and then stand up in front of a jury and talk about the evidence. You know, I would, I needed an opportunity to cross examine them if they were gonna say, put a different spin on a conversation they themselves had with, with uh, John Gotti. So for that reason, and there were a, a number of other conflicts of interest they had. John Gotti said on tape that they had taken $300,000 under the table. They were afraid of tax, you know, a tax count against them. Anyway, it was legally, it was kind of a no brainer. They needed to be out of the case because they were part of the evidence. So we moved to disqualify them, made a big motion, explained to the judge why it would be a complete um, chaos if they were in an uncross and examinable way, if that's a word, talking about our evidence 
and the judge uh, got it right and disqualified them. That also played a role in Gravano Flip. And uh, speaking of Gravano flipping, it was early October that you get a call out of the blue with news that Gravano does want to flip. He wants to help the prosecution out. He wants full immunity in the process. Not very realistic uh, request by him. But uh, what was your initial response when you heard that Sammy the Bull wanted to flip to help you guys out? Well, we were all shocked. There was John Gotti was the stand up guy, obviously, but. I would have been less surprised if I heard John Gotti wanted to flip. Hmm. Sammy Gravano was a gangster's gangster and had been for 30 years. He was the underboss. Uh, nobody. There were people afterwards, after the fact, who said, yeah, we saw it coming. It's a bunch of baloney. Nobody saw it coming. So I was shocked. My heart was pounding when I, I heard we might have a chance to uh, move him from the defense table to the witness stand as my witness, because you know all good lawyers look for a power move, right? In any case, and what would could be the more ultimate power move against John Gotti than to take his underboss away from the defense table and put him on the witness stand against him? So we were excited, we were, you know, anxious eager and worried that it might not work out, but it was pretty exciting to get that call. So the process of flipping him started with a meeting with his wife, Debbie, and eventually you were able to meet with Sammy. How did that meeting with Sammy the Bull go? Yeah, well, it was, the whole thing was a very elaborate cloak and dagger thing to do. And your listeners are just going to have to buy the book to read about that because it was very complicated. Meeting a prosecutor meeting one-on-one -on -one with an indicted defendant without his lawyer present is dicey. So that was a very elaborate um, process. But then I finally met him. And as I mentioned earlier, the first, first words out of his mouth was uh, where he wanted to uh, switch from his government to my government. And we, you know, had to sit down. You can't just say you're going to do that. You know, a prosecutor needs to figure out how can this person as a potential witness help my case? What's his baggage? You know, how impeachable is he? Had to find out from Gravano, you know, what other crimes besides the ones I had charged him of he committed because all that stuff could come out on his cross. It was... It, it was a great deal of effort to get him in a room for an hour for us to figure out whether testifying was right for him from his perspective and whether we would want him on Team America from my perspective. And you eventually decide that it is worth it. And you also just mentioned the cloak and dagger nature of this. That included keeping this a secret from your superiors initially. How upset were they when you finally let them know that uh, Sammy had decided to flip? Um, you know, it depends on which one you ask. But uh, the U.S. attorney was fine. He had, um, you know, he had been the U.S. attorney for since the first trial. So he trusted me. He delegated to me. And uh, I'm sure he would have preferred that I kept him in the loop when I struck a deal with Sammy. But he understood that every it needed to be super secret because the guy was sharing a jail cell with John Gotti. His, his life was hanging in the balance. His family's safety was in the balance. Um, the chief assistant, who is now my law partner and, uh, uh, and a very close friend, a dear friend and a, a luminary in the law, Mary Jo White, was a little less pleased with how I handled it. Um, we didn't know each other that well back then. And if she had, you know, I, I think if, if it were her decision, I know if it were her decision to make, I would have been out of a job. But thankfully, it wasn't. It was the U.S. Attorney's decision. Now, in speaking with Sammy and finding out what he knew and what he had done, you also learned why you lost that first Gotti case. What exactly did he tell you about that? 
Well, you know, that, that it was an involved, uh, the, it was a, the case was fixed and uh, it was a fairly involved uh, process pursuant to which it was fixed that your readers are just, your listeners are gonna have to read about. It was, uh, you know, we had gone four and three quarters years thinking we just lost the case maybe because that defense witness had accused us of crimes, but we we figured out from, we found out from Gravano that there was no way, no how there was ever going to be a conviction in that first trial. Hmm. You write that lawyers spend a good deal of time thinking about all that can go wrong at a trial. What worried you leading up to this one? Yeah, sure. I mean, one, one thing in particular was, uh, is, uh, Lawyers worry about everything. But one thing in particular was I knew it was going to be a packed, silent courtroom with uh, full of wise guys and media and jurors and, def and two defendants. And I was worried that, you know, Gravano, who after all had lived the oath of Omerta for a good 30 years in the mob, I was actually afraid he'd choke. You know, people choke under less pressurized circumstances than that. So, uh, you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to give him a little trial run, see whether he could actually talk about crimes in front of strangers, whether he had it in him, because not everybody can. Some people really want to flip and be government witnesses, but they just don't have it in them to talk about other people's crimes and it doesn't make them bad people. They just, they can't be witnesses. And uh, so I wanted to make sure that the first time Gravano had to tell a stranger about somebody's crimes, it wasn't gonna be um, with John Gotti in the room. So we put him in the grand jury and uh, had him testify about one of the many crimes he committed and we indicted some other people, but you know, it was a little, it's not, wasn't the same thing. Grand jury meets in secret, but it was 23 strangers. So uh, I, I wanted to give Sammy a little bit of an audition and I did and he, and he was fine, he passed. And personally speaking, nearly a month before the trial, you learned that Gotti had put a contract on your head. Did that scare you at all? Well, it was actually during the trial, Trey. And- oh, my, uh, oh, not really, you know, no, he was in, nobody in the street was gonna, the people, the mob, mobsters didn't like John Gotti. He brought the FBI down on all of them. He was, hmm. had a big mouth and he was a celebrity boss. So, you know, the, the marshals and the FBI told me about this contract. I ended up with a bodyguard, but we didn't, nobody in the street was going to like kill a prosecutor and make make law enforcement attention on the mob even more intense for him so uh, we i really just figured he did it to rattle us to rattle me not because somebody would actually like shoot me during the trial i mean god he would never stand a chance of getting acquitted if something like that happened but, you know, a contract's a contract. So we took it seriously, and I had a bodyguard. You're, that bodyguard became a friend of yours all these years later. So silver linings, you uh, gained a new friend out yeah. there, right? Yeah, he's uh, like my third brother these days. So, yep. So uh, a second to last question here, John. What was it like getting those verdi, uh, those guilty verdicts the second time around? What do you think? Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, look, you know, the first, the first uh, crime that uh, the jury was asked to render its verdict on was the spectacular murder of Paul Castellano at rush hour and Christmas season uh, in Midtown Manhattan in front of Spark Steakhouse. So, and that was the, the hardest of our, that was the, the one that was most beatable because um, he had actually denied committing that crime on, on the tapes. So that we knew the first verdict to be rendered was going to be a harbinger. And uh, when the 
the he was found guilty of that crime. You know, all the press rushed out to the no cell phones back then. It was pay phones in the courthouse Carter. Um, and we knew we had finally convicted him and it was a long road, right? We, it was, it was uh, I had spent by then seven years uh, focused pretty much on the Gambino family. It was pretty satisfying. We feel like, especially after that first case, I felt like I had a very important loose end to tie up and we convicted the other, the witness from the first case who accused us of crimes we convicted him of perjury. We, we kind of mopped everything up, convicted John Gotti. It was good, it felt great. We were happy. And what was your emotional response when you found out that John Gotti had died in the early part of this century? Uh, you know, I, I felt bad for his family, honest. Hmm. You know, he, he certainly deserved his life sentence, but I wouldn't wish cancer on anybody. Um, he died of throat cancer. He had a wife who loved him. He had a bunch of kids who loved him. He had a family. So I, honest to goodness, I felt bad for them. And final question, speaking of family, have your kids read this book yet? And if so, what's the review? <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, my kids, you know, they uh, love me as much as I love them. So they're not a good barometer, but they did like the book a lot. Um, they like the dedication, you know, and the acknowledgments. They, I think they flipped through to see if they were in it, but they did. And anyway, they, they liked it. And look, as I say, you know, I started out thinking I need to write this stuff down because it was a really interesting set of experiences. I was lucky enough. I and my trial team, you know, nobody does this stuff alone. And I had really good people helping me on my trial team. And I wanted my kids to read about it. And now they have. So very cool. He is, yeah. He is John Gleason. The new book is The Gotti Wars, Taking Down America's Most Notorious Mobster. Get it now wherever books are sold. John, thank you so much for the time today. And thank you for this very entertaining book. Sure. Thank you, Trey. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. Thanks to all your uh, your listeners too for listening in. Take care. Thank you to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thank you to Joshua Bates for the video editing. You can follow him on Instagram at Forager Digital. And thanks, of course, to you for checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.